Welcome everybody. I'm thrilled to have you all here today for our session entitled In This Moment, Blackness and Intersectionality with Lutetia du Doucette and Taurus Savant. Today's session is part of Geneseo's month-long celebration honoring Black History Month. As part of our efforts of becoming an anti-racist college, these series of events and sessions planned and organized by the Anti-Racism and DEI Subcommittee of the President's Commission on Diversity and Community will hopefully spark discussions, reflections, and actions as we work toward this vision of anti-racism. As I mentioned, we have a month-long series of events. You can find all the events that we are hosting in the calendar, where the link I just posted in the chat. Before we begin, we ask our participants that you mute your microphones during the presentation. We do, however, encourage you to use the chat feature to provide questions for the presenter. We have allotted time at the end for a Q&A. We ask that all questions and comments are grounded in respect. No disrespect for the presenters, moderator, or other participants will be tolerated and we reserve the right to remove participants if these expectations are violated. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Taurus Savant. Taurus is a queer black artist, writer, musician, and community advocate that uses his crafts and creativity to invoke influence and promote individuality, freedom of expression, and change on a variety of different mediums. We also have Lutetia Andre Doucette, who graduated from the Rochester Institute of Technology with a degree in bioinformatics, where she developed protein surface prediction algorithms. After graduating, she was a fellow at the University of Rochester, where she worked in a genomics lab that focused on analyzing the venom of parasitoid wasps to develop new drug therapies for various diseases. In 2017, Letitia authored a report on wage disparities across race, gender, and disability in Rochester and Monroe County in conjunction with the Rochester-Monroe Anti-Poverty Initiative. And in 2018, she authored a follow-up paper on employment barriers for disabled people in Rochester and Monroe County. She's a graduate of the Leadership and Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Fellowship Program and an AUCD Emerging Leader. She is the owner of Catalyst Consulting, which helps organizations examine equity across race, gender identity, and disability in policies, practices, procedures, and relationship. In this moment, Revolution, Reckoning, and Reparation is a project where teams of Black writers and photographers were invited to profile 10 Black leaders from across the city of Rochester. This project was curated by Amanda Chestnut, who is a professor in the Art History Depart Department here at SUNY Geneseo. And I've asked Amanda to say a couple words about the In This Moment project. Thanks, Dave. Um, and thanks for helping us get this set up and making it happen. In This Moment is a project that started uh, about six months ago. I was approached by Jean Strazabasco, who is our project coordinator at this point in time. But then she was really interested in finding a way to support Black artists. She wanted to do something to financially support Black artists, uplift Black voices, and highlight the role of Black leaders in the Rochester community. Um, Jean is white, and she um, knew that to do this most effectively, she needed to partner with someone who was Black, someone who knew the community a little bit better, but mostly someone who would be able to help build those teams and make sure that the project was actually beneficial to the community. Um, and she was uh, encouraged to reach out to me because of my prior curatorial practices. Um, and she approached me about this project. We, um, I was in residence at Visual Studies Workshop, uh, which is accredited through Brockport. It's located on Prince Street, um, right downtown near the School of the Arts. 
and I approached the director Tate Shaw with some of Jean's ideas and we the three of us came up with this book idea so we are um, we created a list of leaders representing a range of ages genders um, range of specialties work that people uh, practiced and I reached out to my network of photographers and writers and we partnered those folks up um, for this 10 book series. It's been almost entirely um, crowdfunded. We've received some grant money, but um, we've most, the majority of the money has been crowdfunded. Um, so this is really a community driven project as well. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, sure. I should also say that Amanda is a graduate of Geneseo. Um, so Amanda is a proud alum and we will be highlighting um, speakers from the In This Moment series each Friday this month. Uh, this is our first panel discussion. They will continue, as I said, each Friday, the month of February. And Amanda is also teaching a class using um, the In This Moment series as the structure and format of the class. So these talks will continue on throughout the semester. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our speakers, Lutetia and Taurus. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Ah. Awesome. So the, for this talk, we're talking about intersectionality. And we only have one talk to do it in. Um, I brought up intersectionality in the classroom the other day um, at Fisher. Um, I also teach at St. John Fisher College and I brought up intersectionality in the classroom and I encouraged the students to do some writing on what they felt intersectionality was. And even though um, the word has been around for a little while, there were still a bunch of them that didn't really know what it meant. Um, do either of you want to give us a quick definition of what you feel like intersectionality means to you? Sure, I think Taurus, why don't you go first? Sure thing. Um, intersectionality to me means um, any combination of assumed identities, life experiences that intersect and overlap, um, especially amongst marginalized communities and how they navigate life and the challenges that they face. Um, it's a part of the it's a part of everybody's individual um individual makeup so everybody has their own uh identities that they that they present as and they live and so when you come in you're not just certain you're not just one or the other you come in as all of them at once you want to be seen as whole Definitely. And I think for me, in addition to that, intersectionality are also the isms that people put upon others, right? It's not the fact that I'm disabled, that really means nothing. But ableism and queer antagonism, um, misogynoir, right? That special kind of anti blackness that, you know, black female presenting folk get to experience, right? So all of those also contribute to intersectionality. Thanks. And I was just gonna say, the next thing I was going to lead with was that the, the talk is intersectionality and blackness. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is often commented with, or often credited with coining the word intersectionality, even though it had been around for a little while, she was really the first person to use it academically, um, is a black woman. Um, how, how does blackness and intersectionality come together is what I was gonna ask next for each of you. <clears throat> um, well, thank you for bringing her up because that was actually in my notes. <laughs> um, it, it like like Kutisha said, it also um, confronts the isms and and the 
the, the challenges that everybody um, who is Black faces. And so just because you are Black, you're not put under just one umbrella. There are a lot of other different components that make up who you are, and you can face challenges based upon that on top of being Black. You know, for some folks, it's or it's, for some folks, it's being Black and being queer. For uh, other folks, it's being Black and being female or female presenting. Um, and other folk, it's it's um, it's colorism, it's ageism, it's classism, and all of those things can factor into a, a varyingly different experience outside of just being black. I think you know, for me growing up, it's not that I didn't know that I was black. I did, you know, we were a black family, but you know, one of my aunts is Filipino, another aunt is white, right? So we lived in a very kind of multicultural household. Um, so it was always kind of like, yeah, this is just who you are. But it was always made very, very clear to me that I was disabled. There were just things that I could not do that my siblings and my cousins could do that was always, you know, very, very frustrating or, you know, constantly having to go to physical therapy when everyone else did after school programs, right? And so for me, it wasn't until I became an adult and had to experience the medical realm as not a very cute, and I was extremely cute when I was young. I'll put it out there, it was disgusting how cute I was. Um, but, you know, as many young black girls experience, once you turn an adult, you ain't cute no more. Um, and so now you're experiencing comments, right? I've had procedures done on me without enough anesthesia and being told, you know, hey, this is because you're black, you don't feel pain, right? And then the, the racism and the ableism kind of combining and seeing this happen, you know, globally, right? With the advocacy realm that I live in and seeing people die from these very real intersections that often aren't recognized. There was a recent article that came out about doctors not thinking that disabled people need medical care and treatment. And what does that look like in a time of COVID, right? And then you're gonna add racism on top of that. And it is quite clear that the majority of them think it's acceptable to not treat you as a disabled person. So what does that look like for the outcome for those with multiple intersections? Great, I really appreciate that. Um, so because we're talking about intersectionality and we're talking about the isms, um, Lucisha, you got into it a little bit. What are, if it is okay that this that I uh, that I be frank, what are the isms that impact your lives? They, in the past, like now that I'm, I'm my own business owner. Um, you know, racism and ableism kind of were like the main things. Um, I think now looking at, because my field is equity, right? I deal with a lot of internalized racial superiority um, that pops up a lot, especially in my style of how I do my workshops, et cetera, like very kind of like this informal where we have discussions and that is not stereotypical DEI, you know, they want the agenda, you know, they want learning outcomes, check the box, how'd I do on the test, right? And I was like, yeah, that's not how life works, right? Um, and how we really learn and practice. So I think those are the two main things that I have been experiencing, particularly now with COVID. Um, I posted on Facebook about my concerns with the Jazz Fest is that the Jazz Fest didn't happen because there's still a pandemic happening. Um, and the very real concern that disabled people have that non-disabled people are just 
rushing out and partying while the majority of those dying from COVID are vulnerable people, right? So that, you know, you're partying while people are dying is a level of cognitive dif- dissonance that we know always existed, but to have it so blatantly put in our faces has been um, quite unsettling. What are your isms, Taurus? What do you struggle with? What, do you, what impacts you? Well, um, what impacts me is, uh, as Lucisa said, racism, um, but also um, hom- homophobia and classism. And while this doesn't direct, uh, this doesn't directly impact me, um, I've had to bear witness to colorism um, kind of at my dispense. Um, and by that, um, I mean that, well, first, even though I am Black, um, both of my parents are Black, you know, sometimes my, my race is not immediately assumed. So people can think I'm a multitude of different things. Um, and because two certain uh, people who are uh, white or possibly non-white, they believe that there are certain things that they can say to me about Black people um, that are unacceptable, um, very questionable things about people who are darker than me or how I would receive a type of preference because I am lighter than what's, and, and thereby what they would uh, perceive as less threatening. Um, so between that and also growing up poor and still being poor, being denied or being um, looked over um, when I raise concerns about what poor Black people need. Um, and also experiencing homophobia um, in throughout my life experience and people who can't seem to separate the entirety of my individ- individuality from my, from my queerness. If they see just that, then they fail to see the rest of me in the same way that people fail to see that I'm Black and all of the other individual, uh, individual challenges that I face. And so when people fail to see it, it makes my life even much more difficult to navigate. There are ways that people have learned to adjust. Um, and even in my, my foray into professional uh, settings and um, social justice settings and a lot of different communities um, around Rochester and beyond, um, I've found I've had to, in certain ways, adjust the way that I appear just to, I guess, appear more palatable to certain folks. And when I've kind of stopped doing that, um, what we usually refer to as code switching, and I just stopped doing that, I notice how certain people are a little unable to stomach it. And it one it leads me to wonder, you know, what their own biases are as to why, you know, they can't handle that. Um, and especially when it comes to all of those facets about me and being more comfortable with myself and coming in to be seen as whole. So I don't ask to be uh, seen as whole in all of my own individual um, facets. I demand it and you will see it. And it's an uncomfortable uh, conversation and an uncomfortable process for some, but imagine how that is for me. So Taurus, you're one of the writers for In This Moment. Letitia, you um, worked as a writer and you were one of our highlighted leaders. I have your book, came in the mail yesterday. Um, What, in what ways did both of you take your awareness and appro- awareness of an approach to intersectionality and apply it to the In This Moment project. I know you both did, I, and th- it's just actually coming up with the words for it. Yeah, I think like for me, it came at a wonderful moment in time. Uh, where I was personally going through, you know, a transition. 
And so I saw it kind of like, you know, this is me being the butterfly, right? And showing people something that one, that is way out of my comfort zone. Um, and two, to be able to show people something that they probably haven't seen, you know, a queer kind of chunky black non-binary person, you know, in her underwear, covered in paint, you know, in all my glory, in all my roles, right? Um, and saying that I accept this body as is, right? Even though I don't identify with any real gender, I'm actually pretty okay with this body. I think it's, you know, we've been through some things, um, there's some mileage, <laughs> and I've had more than one tune-up, but, you know, like, we're still here, and so I needed to celebrate that, too, and show myself in a way that, you know, hopefully if I live to, like, 80, 90, you know, 100 years old, to be able to look back and, and still celebrate that person, right, and all of the transitions that you know, I was going through at the time. So I think for me, not only was it pushing the envelope of what Rochester and the world could see, but also challenging me to see myself in that way that I always describe myself, but never really show. And I love that um, as, as, a, as, a, as a quick uh, relative aside, I have her book right here, or actually I have their book right here, and I think it is a beautiful book and with beautiful photos and beautiful words, and I am glad that I received it. Um, for me, uh, when tackling one subject of Mr. Herb Smith, as many folks would know, that Herb is quite the character with so many lived experiences. Um, and I wanted to make sure that people would see him as more than just the black guy with the trumpet in RPO. He's so much more than that. And so when I think about people, uh, black folks in professional spaces, especially professional creative spaces, um, I want people to understand that there is so much more than that. When I spoke to her, even though we've already kind of met a few times in passing before embarking on this project together, um, I wanted to be sure that he be presented as the authentic self that he is, you know, not gussing it up and using all these nice, you know, academic flowery terms and making it seem like, you know, he likes to, you know, pick roses in the garden as he, as he listens to, you know, Bach or whatever. No, it's you have to edit the second edition. <laughs> There's an F bomb in the second in, in, in the book and we have to edit it in the second edition for school publication. Sorry, Doris. And it's it it is okay. Um <laughs> uh even even per request, you know, he said I, I wanna be I wanna be as unfiltered as possible. Um and that's all right. I think that people when they meet him they will definitely see that um, for themselves. But he, um, he has aspirations and dreams, you know, beyond, you know, just working in music. And classical music is not just the only music that he does. He embarks, you know, on jazz shows. And he, we shared a common taste in cheese and wine, which, I love me some wine. Um, <laughs> but at the very at the very core, he's still a man that is still evolving and is really coming into, you know, the true freedom. So people like to assume that just because, you know, he is where he is now, that he would be like content in pretty much being accomplished in life and saying, well, that's that's pretty much it. And to me, he said, you know, his life is really starting to really pick up and begin. In fact, his life hasn't really started like blossoming and, and really turning into the greatness that he is really, really, you know, hitting the ground with until his later years in life. And so I think it's great for people to see that, you know, even within that moment that I captured that there's still room for so much growth, so much change and so much adventure beyond it. And, and 
for both of you beyond how the project was impacted by your views on sexual uh, on intersectionality uh, how did the how did the project impact you well um the project impacted me because um a lot of people who know me well to start with you know i'm i i while i dabble in a lot of different visual arts and a whole bunch of other uh, creative mediums a lot of people don't know me as a writer so what it did for me was kind of really establish that confidence and knowing that this is something that i can do and i think that it was incredibly important on knowing that a black voice was amplified by another black voice so it wasn't that he you know sort of sat down with you know a fancy publication of of a group of white folks and they gave this fairly sanitized version of who he is he sat down with another black man who understood what he was going through and we shared our own experiences and that made me feel um a sense of accomplishment um and a sense of validation and knowing that black people can write for black voices and people will listen to it and it can be preserved um like these books have been um and i'm just extremely grateful for that and similarly i think one it no one knows me as a writer you know they know my academic work which I love doing. I'm a nerd. I don't care. Um, and so I'll research and write about wasps all day long. Like that's like a happy, happy joy, joy for me. Um, but people don't know that I've been a writer since I was a child. That was one of the therapeutic things for my brain injury that was very, very much encouraged. Um, and I had kind of lost that creative writing bit due to the rigors of academia right? You don't really have time to <laughs> write creatively when you've got to read and digest papers that are sometimes 65 pages long and you've got 15 of them due in like three days, right? Um, and so it kind of got me back to that creative self and saying that, you know what, I'm actually pretty good and that I can do this. And I was like, yeah, Look at you, you know, some mileage, again, mileage. Um, but, you know, we can figure out how to do things. And it just was like, spurred me on. I've now since written a book. I'm actually finishing a second one this weekend. And I've started four more um, in this whole entire time. And hopefully by the end of this year, I'll be on track to having every single one of them published. So I think like for me that like creative drive and that part of me that had been like really, really missing, like it just feels like if I'm not creating then I'm like actually physically sick. And so really honoring that and saying that creation um, is something that is absolutely needed and wanted in life. And I think everyone should just do art I don't care if it's stick figures or whatever, just do it, just create, right? It doesn't have to be, you know, good or bad or whatever that means, but just do art. I'm a big fan of just, just making things for the sake of making. Um, what are both of you hoping that people will gain from viewing your contributions to in this moment? Um, what I hope that people will view is that people, I want people to know that you possess the capability to really do anything you put your mind to. Um, you know more than you actually believe you know. Um, and despite what some folks may see in the creative world, the entertainment field, politics, whatever, um, you have the credibility and the lived experience, the brilliance, the talent, and the overall um, necessity 
to really bring yourself um, into the world and so that you can create your own moment. So I want people to see this and go, you know what, you know, someday I could write something, you know, like that. I could write, uh, I could stop somebody who I idolize and say, can I write this about you? Or maybe in the future, you know, these people realize that actually they have something that's worth writing about. You know, some people will just be like, you know, well, I don't think I'm really interesting. And then you really sit down and talk to them and find out that they have like a bevy of stories and, 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 and lived experiences that people just never bother to ask. And when you sit down and listen to people, you will be surprised at what you would learn. Hmm. Powerful. Yeah, I thinking back to, I got mad at Neil deGrasse Tyson, who was like, well, if it doesn't exist, then create it. And I didn't know why I was mad because as a scientist, that's like my job, right? It doesn't exist, so we create it, right? That's the job of the artist too. Like if it doesn't exist, you you create it. Um, and so I think a lot of this is because I never saw images of myself uh, ever growing up. And still to this day, uh, in the media, portrayals, et cetera, you don't see that black, queer, non-binary, femme presenting people in wheelchairs anywhere. Right, and especially not nude or almost nude, <laughs> covered in paint, right? So I wanted to put that out there for people to be able to see that you can create that image of yourself and that it can and does exist, right? I don't believe that I am a unicorn, right? I know that there's others out me, like me out there, but maybe, you know, we haven't just connected yet and they need to see that someone like them does exist and understands the struggle that they go through. So hopefully people get to see themselves in the way that they maybe don't want to acknowledge or haven't really acknowledged and fully embrace that. But also that for those who aren't like me to see me as I really am, because I often move in this world invisible, right? And so- Unless somebody's trying to push you around. Right. It's like, I get this weird invisibility cloak that disappears and reappears, you know, never at my own whim and always at the whim of other people. And so hopefully you begin to see that disabled individuals exist in your communities, in your families, it might even be you. And that we come in like every kind of jelly bean flavor, right? And so, hopefully that then leads to maybe some sort of change, in how we write and how we see people in this world. Thank you both. And, and I think that especially for the two of you to talk about this project is, is to, in many ways to talk about intersectionality. I, I don't think because I think that out of everyone in the project, the two of you are um, maybe most experienced at publicly vocalizing your own multitudes. Um, I think that talking, I, 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 I think that they just go hand in hand so well. Um, because every, everything I'm hearing both of you say links back to intersectionality in, in, in so many ways. Um, we have a few more minutes before we open up for questions, but I also know that everyone who was in my class got a lot of great questions prepared. So I want to make sure that I'm being respectful of their efforts. Um, um, real quick, um, yeah. while I appreciate um, the, the, the adornment of praise, I also want to give um, a quick note of recognition to one Adrian Elam with beyond their contributions to black history and queer history, specifically with the, uh, the creation and the upkeeping of black pride here in Rochester has helped to really, really um, strengthen uh, my sense of self and seeing that there are other folks who exist in the same space and fairly similar identities who 
are thriving and inciting change and seeing Adrian go out and, and demand and make change um, inspires quite a lot of us, myself included, to feel like it's okay to get up and do that too. Absolutely. There's a lot that I am way more comfortable with demanding because I know that it's right because I've watched Adrian do it already. Um, they're an incredible person and I'm secretly hoping they never leave Rochester. <laughs> I know. Yeah, then people better not take them. I'm just saying. All you Brooklynites. <laughs> <laughs> um, Adrian is one of the In This Moment leaders and will be, I'm hoping, coming in to speak to the students later in the semester. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good, like who, who do you, who else in the community do you see exemplifying what intersectionality can be for the black community? Who, who, do, who else do you see doing that? Where, where is it happening? Who's doing a good job? Hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, I know we could list who's doing a bad job. I don't want to say that. I don't want to say that. What I, will <laughs> what I will say is that there are a, a multitude of people. Um, one of the first names that comes to mind for me um, is Stanley Martin, who um, I absolutely also admire. And when it is time to run for city council. If I'm able, I will give them my vote. Um, but people like Stanley um, and, and so many other people um, just exemplify what I perceive to be as um, a new path and a new journey towards what I, what, I, what I describe as true Black liberation for all Black lives. And so they fight for inclusivity, for equity, for justice, for access, for representation, for appreciation. Um, and to see that happening here in Rochester, when oftentimes uh, we are ostracized from those spaces, or shunned, or ignored, or like Lutetia said, seen as completely invisible until it's convenient, um, the, the conversation shifted from how we can uh, add to what's there versus we don't need to add to what's there and we don't have to join their group or, or sit at their table. We'll just create our own table and create and build something that's sustainable and accessible and um, impactful for, for everybody um, that wants to be there and needs to feel um, valued and seen and heard and appreciated and um, enriched and strengthened to actually realize that they can make change on their own as well. I would like to shout out two people who, one of whom has been one of the greatest contributors on the national stage that doesn't get the credit, the credit is due. Anita Cameron fought for the Americans with Disabilities Act. She was one of those folk climbing up the stairs of the Capitol, um, fighting for our rights and has continued to do so, as well as being a container and a voice for all the Black disabled activists who have died, who've been erased from the national memory, who have contributed from the civil rights movement to the disability rights movement, um, all these different movements. And so she recently had an article uh, that she did where she just honored all these lives and these great people who, because of whiteness, got erased. And so really wanna shout her out because she is living history and she's still pushing these boundaries and talking about disability in ways that you know we still don't wanna acknowledge, especially here in Rochester. The second person, her name is J.D. Flores. She's an Afro-Latina. And so again, another voice of about what that means to be a disabled uh, individual who is seen as an immigrant, but she's Puerto Rican, so not really, right? Um, and how that 
the kind of oppression of English is on immigrants and those who are non-English speakers and how that is a huge barrier to access. If you can't speak English, you're not really getting anywhere in this country. Um, and what does that look like when you are disabled yourself? As well as talking about things such as what we like to call pretty privilege, right? Which I have, I think I'm cute, so that's okay. But you know, I'm viewed differently than JD is, right? My disability is seen differently than hers. Um, talking about how classism can impact you as a disabled individual. So really, you know, two titans in the disability world who, again, often go unseen and unheard, but really we need to give their props because they are making waves and have changed the lives of every single person in this room. What do you think folks who are watching What, two questions, where could they go to learn more about intersectionality and what could they do in their own lives to start gaining a better ability to recognize and understand it? Um, I would say for once, uh, for one, um, and I don't want to say this facetiously as it may sound, but for one, Google is really free. Um, but when you are typing in the word in intersectionality, uh, one of the first names that comes up is indeed um, Kimberly Crenshaw. And she has a, a very um, informative TED talk. And honestly, you start with that, that will take you down the rabbit hole of just incredibly great um, orators and, and speakers and creators. Um, also, um, a lot of the information and lived experiences that I glean are from the people who I follow on Twitter. Um, I tend to trust when people are using, you know, keywords like intersectionality and that they're using it in a fair way. Um, and I have a handful of of people who I follow who are Black and sh share all sorts of different um, identities as far as intersectionality is concerned and go fairly in depth. Um, and it doesn't even have to be on an academic level. It's a day-to-day -day experience and how they feel about events going on in the country, in the world, and how those directly impact them and people that they care about. Um, and as far as what folks, they, uh, what people who are watching can do, you can listen um, and listen with intent to understand. Um, and if you're asking questions in good faith, um, to be sure that you're ready to take that information and really go in depth on how you can understand people who are, whose experiences wildly differ from your own. So I don't know if I can do a shameless plug, but I'm just going to go for it. Do it. This is, I opened it up. <laughs> you could buy my book. Uh, it is called Cultivating an Intersectional Mindset. Um, and so it is available at Panther Graphics, and I can put the link in the chat. And the second book that I'm writing is kind of like the, it's a 30-day guided journal that's out now but some people need a little bit more help. So there will be a more in-depth kind of textbook version to kind of help you with the daily prompts. So feel free to purchase that. I think you can also look at all of these great conversations that are happening because I feel every single in this moment conversation is an intersectional conversation. Um, so feel free to attend all this great programming because I think every single speaker is just amazing and wonderful and something to contribute. You can Google me. I'm the only Lutitia Andre Doucette that exists in the entire world. So like you're not going to get any sort of funky Google search, I promise you. Um, so look up, you know, every single one of the speakers, right? And get to know us. I think we've got a lot of content out there. We've done so much 
and learn more if you're curious. But I think the biggest thing about an intersectional mindset is to be curious about the world. I think despite all of the bad that happens that we love to focus on, I think there are some really cool things that just happen in life. Cool animals that you would never even think of. You know, watch a David Attenborough special. He's amazing and my favorite human being. And learn something. <laughs> like just, just explore and be curious. Uh, Panther Graphics is also the publisher of In This Moment. Um, they are a black owned and operated uh, print shop in Rochester. So, and, and, and what? Union shop. Uh, and a union shop. I didn't even know that. Bonus. Um, oh, that's great. I like that even better now. Um, so it was really important to me when I was setting this project up that we like our, our graphic designer was a black man from the Buffalo area. Our print shop is black owned and operated. So it was really important to me that we highlight black talent from the top down in, in every single element of, of the project. So um, yeah, Panther Graphics is part of that. Yeah. And, the, and they're right here in the city. And right here in the city of Rochester. Not too far from downtown. Right around the corner from me. I love it. I think, you know, if there is an example of how a business should be run equitably, Tony runs an equitable business. The way that he treats his employees, cares about his employees, um, I really would like to honor them. They recently had one of their employees pass away. And just seeing the love, the care, the time and attention that they took to just honor their coworker. Um, so shout out to the Panther Graphics family. We're all thinking about you. Dave, are you all right if we open for questions a little bit? Please do. Early? I think this has been fantastic and I'd love to, to hear from the students and others. So please I do. I know that they all have great questions and I wanna make sure we have enough time for them to start asking them. Please do. Um, if you all want to pop your questions into the chat, I will try to keep up with them, or you can just unmike, or you can use the little hand raise icon, because I can tap that and see who's raising their hand and ask you to unmike individually. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Sophia, go ahead. Okay, so I've heard this question last class. It's kind of like just more of a curiosity, but I also really, um, I really want to know, um, what were your biggest, for both of you, for Taurus and Leticia, um, what were your biggest uh, role models growing up, like who or a friend or anyone, an inspiration, inspirational person or um, something of the sort? And then what about your role models now? Have they changed at all or are they the same and why? I think for me, I can't really pinpoint to like role models in really, really particular because I have so many like in my family, right? We're just a bunch of Creole people who love to say no. Uh, that's like the history of my family. So, you know, even my grandmother who I'm named after, you know, she would register Blacks to vote in Jim Crow South, like when that was like not allowed, right? And so thinking about her, I never got to meet her, but I carry the weight of her name uh, with me for the rest of my life. So, um, and even though it's my life to like screw up or not, um, and I've done a lot of screwing up, which I think is an important part of life. Um, hopefully I've also done her legacy proud, right? So I think that's one thing. But also growing up disabled, libraries were the only place that was accessible before the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I spent a lot of time in libraries. I actually make it my business and so did my family to always live near a library. It's something I still do um, to this day. And so those are places it's like knowledge is free, right? You just go. 
and you can ask any question and nobody judges you. And so those are places that have always been near and dear to my heart. So I have lots of literary friends um, from Mark Twain to Edward Glisson, you know, to making, you know, Little House on the Prairie. Uh, I've lived a thousand and one lives and had, uh, you know, so many journeys. So I think that's super important. Um, but I think the main people to kind of really spur me on were like people like Sir David Attenborough. He don't know me, right? but I think he is like one of the greatest human beings on the planet. You know, what a great job to explore from like the deepest depths to, you know, the highest treetops and mountains and to be that old and still curious and like loving of life. I want that kind of joy um, as I continue. So I think pointing to so many different people, I don't know if I can say this just one. Uh, Sarah, you had your hand up. Do you still have a question? Yes, I do. We'll um, Sarah and then we'll hit the chat. Um, I wanted to ask both of you, um, has your identity ever pulled you in different directions? Um, I would say it has. Um, I, even though I, I embody a whole bunch of different um, identities, the most impactful are being Black and queer. So there are um, initiatives and, and lots of representation I want from the queer side that I sometimes wouldn't get on the black side. Uh, for example, uh, let's even even within uh, civil rights, you know, um, and to kind of sort of answer a little bit of the question uh, from the uh, from the last question asker, um, you have people uh, who 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 um, who had a hand in civil rights who were black and queer. You have uh, James Baldwin, who is um, who is somebody who I admire, um, and also Bayard Rustin who was um, an advisor and aide to Martin Luther King, who had a lot of contributions, including, you know, the March on Washington and, and teaching about nonviolent, um, nonviolent procedures as far as protecting yourselves during civil rights marches. And oftentimes he was stifled and he was demonized because he was gay, um, despite having a hand in um, civil rights for black folks. That translates into today where you have organizations and the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, which eventually the slogan had transformed into all Black Lives Matter because oftentimes a lot of the people who were leading the charge and going out and physically putting themselves on the line and doing a lot of humanitarian work and mutual aid were Black queer folks and Black trans folks who are often going and marching alongside a lot of people who honestly would rather see them dead. And, you know, that that's enough to really galvanize you to fight for representation on two fronts, where you're fighting one battle to be, you know, seen as your authentic self whether you're queer or trans, but also on top of recognizing that there are different facets of Blackness and being not just accepted, but appreciated and respected. I think I was never intending to be an activist or an advocate. Like, he had told me that when I was younger, like, huh, yeah, right. Um, I was gonna be a doctor. I was gonna live my best black self. Maybe, you know, they would let me have a scalpel um, for a patient that <laughs> was annoying. No, I'm joking. Um, you know, like, I, I, that's what I thought I was gonna do. And that was kind of the trajectory. It's why I went into the sciences. Um, and then I started having health problems. Uh, and then, you know, those health problems were not being addressed by the very field that I wanted to go into, right? Um, and so when you are, I knew exactly which school I was gonna go to the University of Rochester. I was like, yes, you know, they saved my life, they did these surgeries, I'm gonna go to that school, I'm gonna get my medical degree from them and it's gonna be awesome until it 
wasn't. And these people tried to kill me on multiple occasions and fighting within the system as a patient, right? Seeing my friends die left and right across the country and around the globe and saying like, wow, there is a real problem here, right? And so it was my advocacy skills, you know, and that kind of tradition that I was steeped in, right? Have a lot of privilege because there's a very long history of activism in my family um, that was kind of the reason why I'm still alive to this day. Um, and so I kind of fell into the family business, right? And I remember the day I quit my job, every one of my family cheered. They're like, you're full time now. And I was like, geez, you guys, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it was never supposed to be this way in my mind, but um, my goal is to get out of that, right? That my activism and my advocacy is strong enough that I end the very inequalities that I see and I have to, to do. Like, I have a time limit. I was like, I'm not, I can't be 10 years into this, right? 15 years into this and still talking about the same issues. I refuse. Something wrong if that happens. Um, in the chat, Michael asked, as a future teacher, I wanted to ask, uh, were there any formative experiences, positive or negative, that you had throughout your primary and secondary education that led you to the work that you do? Yeah, I was homeschooled. Um, I'm a huge fan of homeschooling and virtual learning when it's done properly. Uh, the ways that my family taught me because I was in, you know, traditional school and then, you know, couldn't read or write, which is strange because I was reading at a collegiate level at three years old, right? And so my family understood that something was happening within the school system um, that was causing a problem. And so I was pulled out along with my older brother and we went to museums, we went to the library, we saw art. Um, and if there was something that kind of resonated with us, we had to research about the time period, ask critical questions. You know, that's how they structured um, our learning. And I think that has been so key to who I am to this day, because when I came to Rochester, specifically Fairport and had to go back into the, the mainstream school system, I was like, what are y'all teaching? Like this, what is this? So I got detention a lot um, and was just very disruptive because like, no, this is not how, I was like, this is not how learning should be. Um, and so I think that that is why I am the way I am today. Um, I went to uh, schools within the Rochester City School District. Um, and honestly, if, if, I, if you told, you know, 13, 14, 15 year old me that I'd be sitting here doing this today, I'd be like, you crazy. <laughs> I just would not believe you. Um, but I was, for lack of a better word, um, I became an underachiever because even though I was doing work, um, English was my favorite subject and I would consistently, you know, always be doing better, um, than I guess the other classmates. It never really kind of occurred to me as to why in most folks, either individual learning styles or how any of this really speaks to the uh the emotional um emotional um um states of students uh the things they go through before they get to school the things they go through while they're in school and when they get out um and so i look at you know life readiness and how that had really you know even though yeah i, I read and that was great but like how prepared was i when i graduated high school for what life really had for me as far as adulthood. Nothing, um, <laughs> really nothing. And it's not to say uh, teachers didn't, you know, do their best, but it did look at, it did make me look back at it now and go, wow, this was the education I got. And I, and I see how 
you know, ostensibly ready. I, I thought I was for adulthood and who's really speaking to me, like who has guidance counselors, who has mental health specialists, you know, on site and how there's not so much of that. Um, and there's, there's a lot of components that would ensure a child to succeed. And it makes me want more for city school district kids here and really any, any place else, but especially here, you know, considering that we're always like the lowest performing in the country and it's almost non-coincidental at this point, but I digress for that point. Um, but it just, it makes me want to make sure that people have the resources, the access and the, um, the support that they need to really succeed um, in life. Uh, education and beyond. Let's go Tommy via Zoom and then I'll do Jessica's in chat. Um, I have a question for you, Taurus. So in class, uh, Professor Chestnut, she showed us one of your songs. It was uh, Hit the Ground, which I actually, it was how you like went over a hip hop beat more like singing. I thought that was pretty cool, but um. Anyway, so I'm thinking, how do you feel the messages you spread through your music translate to your audience compared to that of, say, like a normal conversation like we're having right now? Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, and thank you, Amanda, for, uh, for sharing that with people. Um, my songs and the things that I write, um, they were originally poems before they became songs. And, you know, I write and I produce and I arrange and I do all of that. But ultimately what I'm sharing are my own life experiences. And so sometimes you can, you can gussy it up and all of that stuff. But I do feel like if you kind of take away, you know, the melody, you take away the song and you really just kind of look at the lyrics on paper, it's almost conversational in tone. I'm telling a story, I'm giving you an anecdote. And I feel like it's a part or a snapshot of my life that I feel like people can really relate to. And so I like to make sure that whether I am performing, whether I'm painting a photo or a painting, whether I'm painting a painting or writing a poem or singing a song or even sitting here talking to you all here, that you still get me coming across. You can listen to that or look at that and go, yeah, I, can't, I see what he's, I see what he, I pick up what he's putting down. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica had a question for Lutetia. In the text in your book, it stated, I can't talk about leadership development without going through the same process that I'm asking other people to go through. What exactly is this process and what learning curves did you hit along the way that might have made you readjust your process? What is the process of being a leader um, and the process of what it means to live inside of your integrity and your values? And so there's going to be a lot of times, and this is often what I see, um, leaders stray from their values over time when they do not have it as part of their practice to really self-examine and self-evaluate. Um, part of my spiritual practice is to do just that. It's not only daily, but quarterly and with like the seasons, you know, solstice is a thing. Right, and it's a time for meditation and kind of resetting intentions. So I do a lot of leadership development and I do coaching with other leaders and learning how to provide a container. Thank you, Luna. Um, learning how to provide a container for them to have that safe space to be vulnerable. But how can I teach other people how to be vulnerable if I've got this hard exterior, it used to be this very kind of tough, like, yeah, I was cute, but I literally would cut you. I would go, well, not would. I still carry sometimes. Um, so, but like, there is a persona, right? Um, that I used to carry with me. That is the antithesis of what a good leader should be, right? You can't just be popping off on people. Um, because, you know, you was mad about something, you know, two days ago and I'm like, and I knew, you know, that's not cool. Um, and so it's not, 
um, being less of myself, but being more of myself and being more authentic and teaching others to do the same. We could have touched on this earlier. Uh, Zoe asked, where did you grow up and how did that affect you, your self-identity and finding yourself? Me? Both of you. Well, Zoe did not specify. Oh. I grew up, well, I was born in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, and the Japanese are very superstitious people. I was born face up, which they said meant that I was going to be ready for all the challenges that were going to come my way. And they saw it as a sign of strength. And we moved here to back to the United States, and that's when we had the car accident as we were going, I believed it was South Dakota, I'm not sure, um, to be on the Air Force Base out there. And so I moved around a lot as a kid, but California, I think, was kind of like that place that shaped and molded me. Um, that's where we were homeschooled, et cetera. And then coming here to Rochester, uh, mainly the Fairport area, and kind of the culture shock, I'll say, of being in a predominantly white neighborhood versus the neighborhood that I lived in, in California. You know, we lived right next door to the Bloods. They were amazing. Um, baked us goodies and food when my baby brother was born and brought like this huge gift basket, right? Like I didn't have any, like any of this real concept that these people were, were bad. Um, so, and it was a very multicultural neighborhood. So I think like that really shaped who I am, not just the nature of my family, but also like these real critical moments. You go from being a military family with two non-disabled kids and then suddenly there's an accident and now the whole trajectory of the whole entire family has changed and the dynamics have changed. And that still exists to this day. Um, I... Uh, was born in Far Rockaway, Queens, uh, in New York City, which explains the lack of the Ratster accent. Um, <laughs> uh, I was I moved here with my family at uh, at a young age because we wanted to have a better, lot less expensive life. Um, and my mom had a friend who lived here, and she said, "Come to Rochester." Um, in the early '90s, there was a bit of a you know kind of a somewhat of an economic boom. Um, and for more than half of my life, I lived um, on one side of town, on the west side, um, and then the other half, I, or the, in my later adolescence, I moved to the east side, um, and when I was 19, I moved out of uh, my mom's house, and I have lived in the neighborhood of the arts ever since, um, and what that spurs to me is the, the tale of two Rochesters. It's a thing that I've heard about, but never f actually experienced until I moved over here. And what a difference uh, in the quality of life, the people who are there, and the challenges that uh, folks face. And oftentimes, even though I've lived in this neighborhood for more than 10 years, um, there are times where I feel like I fit in and there's a lot of times where I feel fairly othered um, and almost like sometimes my living here becomes a crutch uh, and in a lot of some of the avenues that I, uh, I go down as far as advocacy and, and social justice work because in certain places you can't really get away with, with saying some of these things because people can find out where you live and they can, um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you would be protected just because you're a, you know, a quote unquote neighbor. So there's certain um, protections I have to take um, living over here and reminding myself if I don't already get reminded that you are a black man living in a, a fancy white affluent neighborhood, well, affluent-ish neighborhood. And um it's 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 difficult to forget that um at times, but what it did teach me was the uh, that there's a duality um in this city and having lived on both sides, I think that I do my best to try to be you know a bridge of of understanding um where the isms come in 
um, the classism, the racism, um, the just the two completely different worlds. And I want there to be a better understanding of where everybody, where each of us comes from and how we can kind of be a lot um, more apt to work together towards creating a better future in this city. I'm really, really, really hoping for that despite how um, bleak it may seem at times. Ethan asked in the chat, and this is a bit more of a curiosity, but along the way to this point in time, were there any particular occurrences that led you toward addressing intersectionality here and now? Um, I'd say so, mostly because um, I've learned to realize that despite me, you know, I'm a college dropout. You know, I don't have any fancy degree. You know, I don't belong to any particular organization. You know, I'm not like, you know, I'm just, I'm just me. And I go, wow, I see what's going on. And I, and when I fail to see the representation, um, instead of waiting for the representation to appear or possibly waiting for somebody to say something that I would believe is right so that I can agree with them, I just say, well, let me go in there and shake the table. Let me go in there and be the first to say it. Because sometimes you have to be a catalyst and you have to say, you know, the unpopular thing or say the thing that's true when nobody else wants to say it. And so when I come in there um, and I, I, I step into these spaces, I, I think of representation. And so some, the, the short answer is you have to just be the representation and be okay with the you know, the, ev the evolution and the adaptation that you will have. And your ideals may change, but ultimately, so long as you are still grounded in that sense of self and fighting for that representation, that people will gravitate towards that and we can make a change. Okay, I'm going to interrupt and jump in between you and Letitia. You are part of the In This Moment crew now, so you can't say that you, like, aren't part of anything. Like, you're part of <laughs> I'm sorry to say. <laughs> so, uh, you're part of, this is, the, you're all my, you're all my crew now, and you're part of it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you, Ivy, I appreciate it. I'm used to being othered. I'm used to being on the outside of things. So, honestly, to be included in any echelon of excellence and brilliance that is yourselves, is um, an experience that I'm grateful to have. Yeah, I was like, aren't I part of his crew? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, said, I thought we were way with a crew. Well, y'all my people, y'all my people. <laughs> Leticia, how about you? I'm gonna cup your face. <laughs> Bless his heart. Um, <laughs> I think for me recently, the pivotal moment was four years ago um, when I nearly died. And that process of trying to get the care that I need and knowing that, you know, I was what, 34 years old at the time and that the same thing had happened 10 years prior, right? When I was 24 years old, coming up against the same doctors the same nonsense and you know i think as black people we are like fine wine we just get better with age and there is something in you and i know some of you may be a lot younger you won't believe me but i'm going to tell you this and you can reach out to me when you turn 34 years old right and you'll say lutisha you were right something clicks and I don't know what it is, but you just wake up and like, I don't really care. Um, and so what we are not about to do is get rid of this, right? And so um, there was something in me that said like, if I make it, if I make it, I have to be more bold. If I make it, I have to be that voice because I have known too many who didn't make it. Right. And that this kind of stuff just needs to stop and whatever it is that I need to do, how I need to do it, you know, whatever I got to go through to, to learn the lesson. Also another lesson, be careful what you promise and what you say, especially when you are nearly dying. Cause 
these things come into fruition and then you have to face yourself, right? Um, and so I think for me, ever since then, I've been so much bolder, so much louder, so much more authentically me. And it's like growing every single year. And it just, I just get better with age. And I was like, wow, if I had had this when I was, you know, 24, things probably would have looked a lot different in my life. So hopefully you can just take that and just be bold. Uh, for both of you, what do you hope to see from in this moment in the next 10 years? <sighs> Lots of beautiful, 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 beautiful Black folks of all shapes, sizes, creeds as what exists in, in this moment today. I see so many of my friends who were already in this project, and I think that that's just absolutely amazing to see it almost felt like a little mini family reunion when we went to go take the picture <laughs> um, um but i want to see so many more people i even want to see people i don't know um i i can't wait to discover you know just how many people will be radicalized and memorialized in 10 years i i just i can't wait to see it like hopefully in 10 years, Rochester will be closer, if not there, to the Rochester that we want to see. And that all of the work that every single one of these folks, you know, from the photographers to the writers to the leaders themselves, that like change is made. That's, that's my hope. Um, and that we get to be somewhere on an island with really cute people serving us drinks um, celebrating, right, that we have, you know, arrived and that we get to just maybe not be in the struggle, right, and just get to be liberatory and Black folk. That's what I hope in 10 years. I had, um, before the first book even hit the press, I had people asking me when we were going to pick another 10 people. So, um, I know that there's so many more stories out there that need to be told, but I'm, I'm so tired. <laughs> so tired. <laughs> I, work, I work too much. Um, so yeah, I've kind of been reluctantly dragged into thinking about doing more of these because, because the desire's there. The stories need to be told and, and like Taurus was saying, and preserved and um, uplifted and and there's no one else doing them. And, and if I, we raised most of the money, $20, $50 at a time, which, which really tells me that there's an interest in the community in learning these things. Um, so I, I, I do think it is important to keep telling these stories as long as I have the energy and funding for it, so. Um, Sarah, thank you for asking Lindsay's question in the chat. Um, Torres, how has your music transformed you as a person? Um, it's transformed me as a person that makes me realize that it's another avenue in which I can express myself and people can relate. Um, even if just like this, not dissimilar to paintings, you know, we don't always have to speak the same language to look at a painting and connect about that. Um, even when people are listening to music, yes, a lot of people will listen to the words, but even if you're a person that's just like, I don't really care about what he's saying, I just like how it sounds, you know, people, or even when people listen to songs in other languages, you know, they, they really just connect with that sound. And so for me, it was an opportunity um, to really just really express how I feel, um, I like to have many different outlets in which I do that, because if I didn't and I kept all this inside, I would lose my ever-loving mind. Um, but it has created opportunities for me to connect with people I never thought was possible. Um, even the fact that there is a very, very, very well-known um, artist who I believe is like the best male vocalist in the entire universe, and he appreciates my work and he sees me and he pays for my music. And so it gives me this sense of validation and knowing that I can do anything 
that I put my mind to and that it doesn't matter necessarily what other people feel, you know, if, if you don't gravitate towards it or it doesn't speak to you, that's fine. Um, but I am extremely grateful for all of the connections that it has brought me and all of the, um, the things, the, the wonderful things that people have said, people have told me that they listen to, you know, my songs or they've read my poetry or they've seen something I've done and it really kind of impacted them or showed them that they're able to do it. You know, I always strive to just say that if I can do it, you can do it. I'm just, I'm just a guy on the nice street. So if I can put this together with just, you know, the, the zeal and the creativity, then so can you. Dave, do we have time for one more question? I think one, one more and then we'll have to wrap up. Does anyone have a question? For a good one. Make it a good one. This last one. Tommy, is that a is that a hand up or is that a head scratch? I mean, I'm trying to think of one, but I don't know. They're not really flowing right now as they usually do. <laughs> Let's see. Anyone? I had a question that y'all um, kind of answered already because I was I'm thinking of moving into Rochester. Um, after I graduate, and I was going to ask about like the racism, homophobia y'all face, and if you think it's worth moving to Rochester, and y'all kind of talked about the community there and the um, the individuals that help, so it kind of answered my question. But if you guys have any more input on that, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Alexa. Um, what I'll say is that there are just a multitude of very, 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 very brilliant, loving, caring, and kind people um, who will put their arms around you and love on you like, like you was their child. Um, and I appreciate those people because even within, you know, the stories about Rochester, the, what a lot of people will say, um, what people can never say is that there isn't, there isn't, um, of overwhelming sense of community and a sense of love, compassion, um, and understanding where people will come around for the love of this city and the love of each other and really make you feel welcome, really make you feel loved, really make you feel affirmed. And once you find those people, and they're not very difficult to find, once you find those people and you express, you know, your desire for being understood, being seen, these people will take you in and you will feel all of those things. I think like the biggest thing is racism and homophobia are everywhere, right? Um, so it's always gonna be there. The thing is you gotta find who your people are and connect with them and be open to connecting with them and accepting them and all they hot mess or not, right? Because a lot of people, you know, they're going through too. And so finding who, who do you wanna connect with? Right. I think for me, a lot of my community exists online and has for decades. Right. So, you know, that's kind of where you'll always more find me. Um, I'm a couch queer. Uh, I'm that one who says maybe I'll attend the event in the before times. And then they're like, where's she at? Yeah, she on the couch with the cat. So, you know, that's just what it is. But, you know, you've got to find out who you want to connect with. Right, not just around your identity, but what do you like to do? Right, I have a fencing community, I have a crafting community, I have a deep space nine community because truckies are awesome. Right, uh, you know, there are so many different communities that are out there that, you know, want you for who you are and all of you. So just find it. Thank you. That was very helpful insight. Dave, do you want to wrap? I, I, I do, and I love that. I think it's actually a fantastic note to wrap up on. Absolutely. Um, I want to thank everybody, um, Amanda, Leticia, Taurus. I want to thank you all for sharing your time, 
and most importantly for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Taurus, you made this comment about not having a fancy degree, but no apologies. I think you and everybody in this room are such perfect examples of how we are all coming with our own lived shared experience and that we can all gain from each other and that we are all here for each other. We all have our own sets of knowledge and expertise. Um, and it's just within all of us to open up and, and listen to each other. I am grateful for Lutetia and Taurus for sharing your stories. And I am very appreciative of you both being open and sharing this gift with us um, and helping to educate us, helping to educate our community um, and what we can do to be better allies and to be better um, leaders. So I wanna thank you both for your examples and your leadership. I wanna remind everybody here that we have more events planned um, throughout this month. Um, I hope you will all join us for the discussions that we'll be having. And um, I hope you're able to take something away um, from this conversation that we're having. Um, and I hope you will find something that you can apply as we all move forward in this journey towards becoming an anti-racist college um, and becoming more anti-racist individuals ourselves. So thank you all. Thank you so much for giving us space and we really appreciate it. <laughs>